very warm welcome for Joanne Wojtek. Thank you. Welcome, Joanne. Yes, yeah, so I get to do my 30-minute talk that was going to be 15 minutes and 30 minutes now, so hopefully it all works out. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start. Let's see how this works here. Yeah, oh, no, I went too far. There we go. OK, a little bit about my program, because it's always good to let you know why I'm up here and what I have to do. Um, I manage, as mentioned, the Solutions for Enterprise-wide procurement. It's basically the um, second biggest IT contract vehicle in the government, the US government. Um, we, um, it's managed by NASA. I'm a NASA employee. And we've been doing it for about um, 20, 25 years now, getting on, onward to there. Um, it's, um, it's a contract vehicle that anybody in the US government can use to purchase um, ICT and AV uh, products and services. We have about 4.5 million light items on our contract, unique line items. Um, we have 145 companies with contracts. And, and through those contracts, we have access to about 4,600 providers. And all those numbers change every day. We're very dynamic. We're always, well, not every number. The, we, the number of contract holders, 145 stays the same. But the number of products that we have on the contracts, the number of companies that, that work with our contract holders um, increases um, actually pretty dramatically every day. Um, we are one of three agencies that are authorized to serve the entire federal government. Um, but along with GSA, who many of you know if you work with the federal government, we're the only federal government we're the only agency that actually every government agency uses. So um, whether it's uh, DOD or Commerce or Veterans Affairs or NASA itself, um, we're used by every agency, um, which, which makes all of what I do very interesting because I, um, I have to not only think of you know, what is it that I think people should do or what NASA thinks people should do, but what every single agency thinks they should do, which is different for each agency. We have about 30,000 customers. They all think they do it right. Everybody else does it wrong. Um, so anything we do has to, be, has to work with the entire range. Um, our emphasis is customer service. Um, for both government and industry, we're kind of unusual now in the government. We actually want to work with industry. Uh, we see you as our partners, those of you in industry. Uh, part of what I enjoy about Open Group, and, and particularly the OTTF, is my ability as a government employee to learn more about industry and understand what drives industry versus trying to think I know what it is and, and, and drive it perhaps in the wrong way. Um, and our basic goal is to, is to make acquisition easier for the government um, and in some ways easier for industry um, so that it's not, we understand that if it costs industry more, it's going to cost us more. So we want to make sure that it's easy all around. That kind of gives you an idea of, of why I'm here. This is, I, I love Dilbert, so I always have to bring up Dilbert. Um, our, um, as, you, as you read this, um, uh, uh, we're not a, we don't actually acquire things. We don't, we don't buy things for people. We run a program that people use to buy from. And what makes that um, interesting, that's why we talk about the customer here, is that we have, we're worried about how can we uh, help our customer out. Um, and um, as, as you can see, they, it's all about information. Um, and I consider that to be one of our main, main focuses um, in, in what we do is we try to inform our agency decision makers um, on, uh, on issues of importance like as we'll talk about supply chain risk management. So a little bit about supply chain risk management. Um, I'm going to talk about two particular areas um, here. One is about um, um, authorized resellers and, and, and the supply chain, the provenance of products, and then we'll talk about OTTF and, and, and some of the issues we're, we're facing. But the, the bottom line issue is, and this is one that I'm, probably everybody out here understands, but the government does not. There's this idea out there that if we do the right thing, we're going to have 100% assurance that everything is good, and all we have to do is, is require industry to do the right thing, and bang, this, everything is solved. And, and to get my government customers to understand that no matter what you do, there's always a, a risk involved, that in fact, it's all about risk management. Um, we can identify it, we can assess it, we can decide whether, it's, whether what we want to do is worth the risk or not worth the risk, but no matter what we do, there's always a possibility in this world that something's going to go wrong, and, and we have to be aware of that. Um, and so it's up to the acquirer to do an analysis. 
Um, the more money you spend, the less risk there is. But the government doesn't want to spend money, so they try to find other ways to, to force the issues. Um, and, but it's not, a, it's not free to, to lower your risk. It either costs time or resources to do so. Our goal, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is, is information. So my program is, is, is around not to tell people what to buy, not to tell people what, to, what, to, what the right risk is, but to give the customer the information that says, here's, here's what you need to balance out and then decide if, you know, where, where you want to put your emphasis. So one of the key ones we'll talk about in a second is product provenance. How, does, how do the items get from industry to the government? And then, um, and then our plan is to utilize the OTTF to provide some more information in, in, in terms of, um, of lowering the risk. And we'll get into that in the next few slides. So we've come up um, in, in our program with something we call the MASDON, because we have manufacturer authorized supply, it's a, you know, a subset distributor, um, one time and unknown. So that, that's our MASDON picture. Um, what we do for our, every customer, for every line item, when they're giving a quote, we tell them the relationship between the, the, the company that is either the manufacturer, because we have Dell and HP and IBM are on, on our contracts, but we also have a lot of resellers, value-added resellers. So we want to tell our customer for every line item what the relationship is between the, uh, the reseller, the person they're buying from, and the originator, what we, what we call the provider. Um, and, and so pretty much everybody knows about authorized resellers. And if you're a big company out there, you're not going to like me because I don't, one of my things I say is I don't, I tell my customers authorized reseller is not the, the do all and be all and it's not the only thing you should ask for. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that as to some of my reasons why. Um, it does make sense for certain, for bigger companies that you ask for authorized resellers because they tend to have an authorized reseller program. But, but I have 4,600 companies out there providing products and services and most of them don't care who sells the products. They don't have an authorized reseller program. It's not a simple case to just say everybody needs to be authorized. But if they are, we tell our customer. And one little side note to this is we found out that we don't rely on paper signatures saying that they're authorized. We actually go back to the manufacturer and say, are they really authorized? We found out there's a lot of paperwork out there that people sign, um, well, not sign, they have a rubber stamp um, of signatures and, um, and a rubber stamp of who's authorized. And it's not always as, uh, as clear cut as actually going back to the company like Cisco or Oracle or IBM and saying, are they really authorized? Um, but one of the, um, the other things is that there's a lot of distributors out there, some big ones, Ingram Micro, Tech Data, um, that, that companies utilize to, uh, to sell from. And, and we need to tell our, our customers that maybe that's okay. And while gray market may not be um, something you all want to hear about, but it's not always wrong, it's just risky, um, and, but it can save a lot of money. And you know, if you want to take the risk, it's there. Or maybe it's not so much gray market as it's just unknown, which is, which is what, what it mostly comes down to. So again, we're not here to tell our customers which where to go, but we're gonna tell them for each item they're buying and they can make a decision. I only want authorized or approved resellers, or maybe I can use a distributor, or maybe I'm buying a cable and I don't really care where it comes from, it's just a cable, and, and they'll go ahead and, and handle that. So um, I kind of mentioned some of these. For, for some large manufacturers, an authorized reseller is a defined program, a process that requires technical knowledge and or money. And or money. And I don't think the government always understands that part of the authorized reseller process is that the authorized resellers pay money back to the manufacturer. Um, and importantly for our customer, if, if somebody's not authorized, maybe they can't get, a, get warranty on the item. That's probably the most important issue. Um, and they don't know where it came from. Um, we just had one recently where um, somebody bought some products from somebody else maybe reconfigured them and then sold them back to the government. There's a little risk involved in that, so, you, so we have to be careful about that. Um, I once had a customer come to me and say, is it okay if I buy off of eBay from Thailand? Um, you know, a major networking piece of equipment. I was like, well, I don't think that's a good risk. <laughs> um, but the problem is that some companies allow resellers to resell their products without being an authorized reseller. Um, and again, there are companies like Tech Data and Ingram Micro who are out there distributing that are not that are themselves authorized to sell things, but are not necessarily um, the um, a direct authorized reseller. 
So some other issues, um, you know, authorized reseller sounds good until you realize that sometimes people are authorized for some things and not others. Oracle, they got hardware and software. Some people are okay for the authorized for hardware, not software. So just to say I'm an authorized Oracle reseller does not necessarily indicate the, the type of reseller they are. Um, and there, it can be, a, uh, if you do 100% reliance, again, sorry for those who think that you should, um, and I've had arguments with some of the big companies and, uh, about this. 100% um, reliance to me has some negative connotations. Government has a big push to do small business and, and they can't all afford to be authorized resellers. It does reduce competition and it does put decision making in the hands of the manufacturer as to who they want to sell their products through. Um, and it may not just be, it may not be um, always to the benefit of the government in that case. And I have a lot, this is a very short version of a very long talk that I do, so um, you can ask, certainly ask more questions as, um, afterwards. Um, so let's shift a little bit to standards and guidelines. Um, just in general, something I, um, in, in working with the OTTF, um, I remember uh, we were at a NIST meeting, and, I, and Andros may remember exactly how many it is, but I know there's over 100 groups that are working on supply chain risk management standards, um, and there still seems to be that many, and what each of them is doing and how they describe it and it, it all, it, it's, it's such a large area um, that it can be very difficult. Um, but that also indicates how important it is that there are so many people working on it. Um, NIST is certainly a big part of that, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology here in the U.S. government. Um, they do a lot of work and, 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 I, and the OTTF is certainly um, in, involved with them and I'm, whenever possible, I can get involved with them also. And then we also had the, as we'll, yeah, as we'll talk about the, the actual open group and the open trusted technology provider standard. Um, we did include that um, standard in our, our RFP that went out when we started our latest version of the, of the, con of the um, contracts. Um, we do have two government participants in this standard, myself with, with the NASA suit program and, and Don Davidson from DOD. And um, as I think we'll mention a few times, it is now an ISO standard, which I think is an extremely important part of the, the process. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in here because Andres can, probably does better talking about what OTTS is. He's the chair of the, of the board. And, um, but the basic concept is we're not trying to solve all the problems. We're not trying to, again, do 100% no risk. We're trying to say, what is it that we can set up as a standard that will tell customers that there is less risk for tainted and counterfeit products. Um, hopefully a lot less risk if, 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 if these standards are followed. Um, so there is, uh, there is a standard out there. Um, it is, we do have an accreditation program. Um, and Andras's uh, group actually has, has, has gone through that. And as I mentioned, it is an ISO standard now. Which makes, it, which is really good. So we have a standard. We have a standard that fixes all our problems, right? It's 100% standard, it's gonna fix our problems. We don't have to worry about uh, counterfeit and tainting anymore. And it'd be great if that was true. But we have some barriers that exist besides the fact that it's not 100%. We, and I think that this is not something that is just true about OTTF, it's true about any standard, I'm sure. But we have the chicken and the egg paradigm. And uh, it, it, almost every meeting, every discussion we have, we, we, we hit this problem. Industry doesn't wanna go out and spend money to prove that they are, are, are meeting a standard if no one is asking for it, and nobody is gonna ask for it if nobody has a certification that they can do it, because if I went out and asked for it, it doesn't help me, because nobody, nobody's actually certified. So, so we really are stuck with this, this how, how are we going to get past this, this barrier of um, uh, who, who goes first? Um, so one way is, is, how, is can we reduce the cost to industry so it's worthwhile for them, um, and the other way is to not so much say to, to, to customers, go out and require the standard because nobody does it yet, so if you require it, nobody does it, but start talking about it. Start making it best value decisions. Start making it something that is in your processes that once people start doing it, the customer is ready to start using that to say, this, this co company reduces my risk. I should use them over this company who's not certified and therefore has not reduced their risk. The other issue is, um, is who should be certified, and I'm, I, I quite honestly am not sure yet who, who should be certified from my point of view. Um, as I mentioned, I mostly deal with value-added resellers. I do deal with manufacturers and integrators also. I kind of deal with everyone in, in a sense through this program. 
but the fact is, tomorrow, not everyone's going to get certified. Um, so, um, so we still have to struggle with the question of, are we really focusing on, on reducing counterfeit and training and tainting, counterfeit and tainting at the um, manufacturer level, uh, when it's getting integrated, when that reseller goes in and maybe does some value add. They're all very important, I'm not, and I'm not suggesting that they shouldn't all be certified at some point, but where do we start is, 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 a, good, is, is a question I'm, I'm kind of faced with at this point. Um, I have 145 resellers, that might be a good place to start. Uh, versus the 4,600 manufacturers just because of the, of the numbers. So you have those barriers. So what's our path to, to, to fulfill some of those barriers? Um, after, and Sally can think of how long this has been going on, the discussion of, of, of certification levels, I think we finally have reached the point of understanding that we really need to have not just a fully certified, third-party certified um, level, but to get things started, to break that that who, who comes first, um, go beyond just requiring that third party certification. Clearly a third party certification is, is the better of anything because you, you're gonna have an independent authority go in and make sure that whatever that standard is, is being met. But it is a costly and long process it, um, and it, the, the no industry persons, uh, you know, except for those who maybe see it as a possible di differentiator, they're not going to just jump up and say, yeah, I'm going to spend lots of money and go through a process for nothing. So we're going, up, going, going to a self-certification level to kind of get things started. Um, it is something that, um, it's, it's, as I've learned this week, I'm, I'm learning new things all the time, it's called compliance if it's a self-assessment. But a lot of people talk about being co compliant to other ISO standards. So it's a terminology that is not unusual out there. Um, and I think that's very important for, for, um, for getting adoption. We sit in, our, we sit in this uh, open group forum or standards forum and, and we all know what we're talking about. When we're going out and talking to companies that have no clue what open group is, have no clue what a standard is, we need to talk their terminology. And they know about self-assessments, they know about compliance. Um, because many of them will say, I'm ISO certified. That's another problem we have. I don't think it's on here, but I'll go to my, one of my companies and say, well, we have a new ISO standard. They say, oh, we're already certified. And they mean they're ISO 9000 certified. And companies, many small companies think that that's what ISO is. And we have to you know, make sure we're talking language that both lets them know, know there's other ISO standards, but it's still kind of the same thing. It's a process-driven standard. Are you following those processes? Let's make sure that you're doing things that reduce our risk, in this case, for counterfeit and tainted products. Um, by having a self-certification, we, we, can, we can get to a point of, of asking for our, our co companies to show that they are self-certified, to use um, uh, the, um, and Sally, what's the right term? I always forget the right term here. Warranty and represents, yeah, war war to warrant and represent that they, that they have met that standard through the open group, that will be part of the self-certification. Um, and, um, and then I will feel a lot more um, confident in going out into my program and, and saying, I'm going to inform my customers if anybody has made that self-certification. Um, it might take a year or so before this really gets rolling, but at least it starts, it starts the process out. Um, and, and what, what that then does is it brings information to our customers that there is a standard out there, that there is a way to show compliance with it, and then if you're dealing with somebody like DOD who really wants more than just a self-assessed requirement, we can say, yeah, and then there's a, there's a third-party certification. It's gonna take a little longer, so start with the, th with the self-assessment perhaps, and then move yourself forward. So who should be certified? As I mentioned, the, 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 the key question, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on manufacturers, we're gonna probably focus on value-added resellers, um, but we're gonna also see where our customers end up taking us in terms of, of who should be certified in, in these situations. I believe that that gets me to, to Andras. So Andras, if you wanna give a little bit more about um, the open group itself and the open standard, OTTF. Yeah, no. <laughs> All right. Um, well, you know, one of the things that I think that was really unique about uh, this particular forum was that we got 
um, all angles of the membership kind of covered. We have the customer angle, uh, Joanne represents that from the government's perspective. We have the vendor angle. We have uh, integrators and channels, and we have the certification labs. And it was also really interesting, to, you know, how the whole forum evolved, because really it was the outcome uh, of uh, a public-private partnership and, and that's very unique, and we do a very good job of that here in the open group. Um, the forum's primary uh, uh, asset that we've created is the Open Trusted Technology Provider Standard. Um, the purpose of the standard is to mitigate two primary risks that we did a tremendous amount of research on to determine you know, how to actually mitigate risks in, uh, of uh, uh, to the supply chain from a technology point of view. Um, traditionally, uh, the supply chain security perspective has really started with how do you actually manage your suppliers, but primarily focused on ensuring the integrity of the product as it's delivered into the hands of the customer. And uh, our standard really extends that idea to all the way from design uh, through the sourcing of the components to development and to uh, the delivery and sustainment, which is very important from a technology point of view because technology is constantly being updated and delivered, especially in, in the cloud now. Um, so those two risks that we're mitigating in our standard are uh, the risks of uh, maliciously tainted components uh, and uh, the uh, counterfeit uh, component. So we're trying to mitigate counterfeit and maliciously tainted. So what maliciously tainted is, is any capability uh, that's been added to uh, a particular component that uh, isn't uh, part of the authorized uh, uh, product or component is uh, considered tainted. Obviously, you know, you would think of viruses and worms and so on and so forth, but that includes back doors or, uh, you know, listening components. Um, and then, of course, uh, from a counterfeit point of view, it's any, any non-authorized uh, uh, channel support uh, from a product point of view. Uh, uh, in the government, they were seeing a lot of uh, chips that were being ablated, the top of, and re-, re uh, marked and then sold as authentic, that, that's definitely counterfeit, or I could manufacture from scratch and pass it off as your product, uh, that's also counterfeit. So those are the two major risks, um, and at this time I think I'd like to ask uh, uh, Steve up, and I think he's gonna ask us a few questions. Certainly, and if there are any more, uh, I've got a couple, but if there are any more questions from the audience then please, uh, it's not too late, but uh, sit up here. I'll, I'll start by one of the things I always, I always think of when the uh, <coughs> NASA soup program or the soup program is mentioned is just the sheer size of it. And I think you've been very modest about, uh, about that. But from a, are you able to give us an idea of the, the yeah. scale of the budget that, uh, that your, the, the program is uh, governing? Yes, yeah, so we, we are currently at about 3.1 billion a year of products going through the contract. Um, and as I mentioned, every government agency uh, has, is utilizing these contracts. So it's, um, it's, it's sometimes a little, a little frightening how big it is. And we're actually expecting, my, my expectation is actually that we'll, we'll double in size in the next couple of years uh, based on, on a number of factors. Yeah. That's <laughs> That's and and, and as, That's a, as, as a, uh, a side note to that, because some people say, I, I just had a, a talk about um, the U.S. government to understand the, the money involved. So we're number two. Number one is GSA. Um, they do $17 billion through their schedules. And, and actually, number one is everybody else, which is $80 billion. Uh, there's a lot of IT being bought by the government, which is why issues like this can be very important. It's, 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 not, it's amazing how, how they keep buying. <laughs> right. Yes. right. So, uh, first question I had, since, since uh, you and I this morning, Andres, were talking about uh, uh, executable standards and open source, right. what's the open source angle on something like this? Because one of the fears, obviously, that, that people hear about for open source products is 
you really don't necessarily, there's less of a, an a ability to have a warranty and representation kind of situation. What, how does, what's the open source angle on this? Well, there, there is a very significant open source angle because the government has a significant open source initiative. Uh, and a lot of folks, including the government, uh, incorrectly believe that somehow open source is free. Open source is a channel, it's not free. Uh, and so you've got to get the open source from the right channel that has uh, the life cycle and product support management that underpins it uh, that I think that the panelists talked about before mm -hmm. with respect to open uh, Pegasus and certainly that's our perspective within IBM too is that you have to have that life cycle and product management piece in place and that includes uh, all of the processes that we have in the standard to mitigate the risks uh, that somehow you're not pulling in components or, or allowing somebody to um, add some, some uh, mischievous uh, elements to the open source itself. So uh, that's you know, a very significant part of open source because there's a lot of open source out there. Just because you can go out and get it and, it, and it's free doesn't mean it's necessarily um, A, without risk, and B, um, oh, uh, able to support your overarching mission. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Joanne, you mentioned uh, on one of the slides that um, this is now an, an ISO standard. Yes. Does that make it easier for you and your, and your program harder? Or uh, you did mention that yes. ISO means different things to different people, but is, uh, is I, that a big plus? Or? I, I think it's it's an amazingly big plus for us. Um, you know, as as much as I know Open Group, I've been involved with you all for a long yeah. time. Um, most of the government does not. Um, so I can go up to anybody and say, the open group standard, and they're like, who is that? Mm -hmm. If I go to somebody and say ISO, for better or worse, it doesn't mean that it's better or worse, it's just the reality of life. I say ISO, they're like, oh, this is something real. I, I know ISO, you know, and I, I, I know the language that, I speak, that you speak of, and, and government you know, really likes ISO. It's a big thing. If you say you're an ISO standard, it kind of takes, oh, okay, Some, somehow that wipes away a lot of concerns. So it, it's actually the same standard as the open group uh, standard, yeah. but it, it now has that, 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 that statement. It, is, it has made it through that, that special standard process yeah. that, that people like to see. Right. Really important distinction, Steve, because we're able, as the open group, uh, we have the authority to be able to take our standards and submit them to ISO at, via PASS. Um, and as Joanne mentioned, not only is it an ISO standard, but because it became an ISO standard, now you have uh, ANSI and uh, the BSI, British Standards uh, Institute, uh, I think that's what the I stands for, uh, mm -hmm. supporting it now as well. So really, really uh, important points. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it, as you say, we've got this ability to do that in the open group, and it doesn't always there's not always a requirement to do it or a need to do it, but clearly mm -hmm. uh, for government it makes a big difference. So, yep. so, so um, you mentioned that, that it's uh, relatively rare for a, uh, Joanne, sorry, you mentioned that this is ver relatively rare for a, a government agency to want to work with industry uh, actively. And, mm -hmm. and um, has it been a, a positive experience uh, in this particular case? And are there, are there others that that you've experienced that are similar? Yeah, I think, you know, the reason my program is, is, is where it is and part of why we're growing is because we, we've always had the view of industry as a partner, which just is unfortunately not a big part of, of the, uh, the US government's view, at least. Um, and um, whether it's little things like, I went to tech data. I mentioned distributed tech data. I went to their headquarters. I was the first government person ever to enter their headquarters. Wow. I'm like, Really? Well, you know, I'm, not, you know, I'm not that important of a person that there shouldn't have been other people who think you should talk to a distributor uh, and, and learn how they operate. And uh, just sitting in the room with, with IBM and Cisco and Oracle and HP and Dell and, 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 and then the, the, the labs and uh, the people who are in this, this, that community, hearing them discuss things gives me a sense of, of, of where the issues are. And all too often, the government sits back and says, well, first, they, we, we have an interesting dichotomy in the government. We either think industry knows everything, and we should just follow them because they are perfect, or they're the devil incarnate, and, and we should you know, hold them at, at arm's length for everything. We are perfect, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and neither is true. And, 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 and that, that's what I find in the, so fascinating, is to, to learn where, that there are, are issues. And, and we're, we can all make this a, a, a working hand-in-hand -hand process versus a, you know, ant one against the other. Right, right. And from a vendor point of view, I'm sure that 
it, it, it's a relatively unusual environment too to, to do this. Yeah, I mean, one of the important um, elements of this whole discussion, especially around the certification, uh, is what is the business case for me to invest in certification? Because you know it's non-trivial. Anytime you do sure. any kind of certification, and so my company is uh, certified, and uh, the business case that we had uh, was driven really by the government and by uh, our integrator. Uh, partners who were asking for this information anyway, and we figured, you know, hey, why not just get certified and we'll have the information on hand and we can provide them with it as, as necessary. And we know that other companies are going through the, the you know, the certification process too. Mm -hmm. And we're currently working on uh, self-attestation, self-certification as, uh, as a first step into this area to give uh, folks, as Joanne uh, suggested, uh, an opportunity to participate, you know, kind of crawl, walk, and run. And at the higher level, we'll probably see the integrators, uh, you know, um, also taking it uh, a step further as we go into the future for weapon systems or high assurance systems and adding that to their perspective. So I think this is uh, really important uh, that we now have this international standard and we have the, gut, the customer, uh, you know, they're, they're asking for it, and this makes the business case a lot easier. So we talked about the customer in, in, in this case being your program, Joanne, and, mm -hmm. the, and the, the US government. Uh, are, you, it, are you aware of other governments using uh, the standard, or um, is, is, it a, is it applicable to big commercial organizations too? Should they be looking at this when they're doing their procurements? I think it's more, I'll just view that. I, I will say one, one interesting note um, is I, I actually got to, uh, to meet with Eastern European countries who don't know anything about the standard. Right. <laughs> um, uh, through a program the, the Department of Commerce does, I got to go to Moldova, an interesting little, little country. Um, and and, and um, I will say for them, they aren't ready for this. They're, they're, one, of the, one of the fascinating pieces was that their main concern is corruption and getting hacked by Russia. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, to counterfeit and tainting wasn't quite on their, their radar yet. But I think I think when, as, if you're not talking about those kind of developing areas, you probably do have have other governments should be looking at the same sort of issues. How how do you mitigate the risk? Again, you're not going to you you're never going to say I've 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 gotten rid of the risk, but how do you mitigate it? And and our, I think the other thing that is the government doesn't quite understand is why isn't industry just driving it themselves? Why isn't industry asking industry to do it? I don't know, Andres may have better insight as to that. Well, I think that when we started this effort, uh, there was a recognition that the industry was working on it, um, but it takes a significant amount of investment to mitigate the risk, and so you really have to be a kind of top-tier supplier or, or vendor. So uh, the the you know the primary folks who are were best at this were the ones that were creating secure engineering. Um, in our case, we call it secure engineering framework, uh, uh, secure engineering initiatives. Microsoft, Oracle, all these guys have all of all of the uh, you know the tools in place to be able to mitigate the risks. And one of the things that we did was we came together and shared our practices and kind of codified them, so that we could help the end-to-end -end supply chain. That helps us too because we are. On one end of, uh, on kind of both ends of the spectrum of the supply chain, we're both suppliers, but we're also uh, the customers of the com component suppliers, and we we need to mitigate the risk to our brand names as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it, it, I mean, it's typically the case with with any kind of certification program, whatever. There needs to be that that pull for, from the customer for the vendors to want to do it. You described the chicken and egg. Yep. And yes. how, do, how do we break the egg? And, <laughs> You know, we had that experience, um, in fact, involving your program, Joanne, uh, years ago with our Unix certification mm -hmm. program. Yeah. You know, that was definitely um, the fact that if if you wanted to bid on a on a on a contract, you needed to have a uh, a certification uh, under the single Unix specification program that we run. Then, um, if you could, if you didn't have it, you couldn't bid. Right. That got the vendor's attention, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, they 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 want to be part of it. So. Uh, yeah, that, that's fairly typical. So um, you said a little bit, make this the last question unless anyone has one from, uh, from the audience. Uh, you said a little bit about the, uh, the next steps or the roadmap for what happens next for, for the certification program. You're going to start with, uh, with the self-certification um, self type approach and the, the, um, what's next for, 
for the standard? Do we leave the standard as it is? Does it need to evolve? Does it need to change? Uh, I, the standard is changing as much as what we're doing some optimization uh, around the, the wording. Um, we're making the, uh, the certification policy. We actually changed the name of accreditation to certification because internationally it's called certification regardless of whether we think it's more like an accreditation mm -hmm. <laughs> program or not. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, this, the tier one, two, and three approach where, you know, you have different channels of certification, self-certification, third party, uh, and then maybe third party extended or something like that is certainly, uh, you know, uh, kind of where we're going. But we're real, really, really, really trying to do two things. One is market outreach and adoption. Uh, and then working on the lower end of the tier one because you really need to be able to have that crawl, walk, and run because uh, the smaller channel vendors uh, don't have the resources necessarily uh, to go directly to third-party um, assessments. And so we want to facilitate the industry to come into this from a crawl, walk, and run point of view and not just top-down, the big guys approach. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so one of the interesting things is I'm I, I, I'm I'm more in the commercial arena, the you know the very commercial products and and ta and so worried about that more low, lower level and resellers and such. And, and Don Davidson, who's from DoD, has the opposite view, which is why you right. mentioned tier three, which is he's from the DoD major weapons and major mm. uh, crit critical items. And so he's actually um, interested in going in the other direction, which is one of the areas we have to look at is having more rigid requirements um, that if, you know that that you have to meet to to deal with his program so right. so what's what's cool about this 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 particular program is you have both ends of, of right. the customer being represented here so um, sometimes we you know it, it adds a little tension but it, the tension can be good if, if it's used to make the program yeah. better and we don't have to modify the standard right. to to actually you know, satisfy the needs of those two three different categories mm -hmm. because the standard actually has shoulds uh, or shalls, uh, musts, in other words, you must do that. Um, and, and it has some attributes that you could consider as higher level assurance that you, you know, uh, n not only might be able to implement, you know, in the current standard, uh, but could require for higher assurance uh, projects. Okay, thank you. Well, we're, we're just about out of time. I've got a couple of announcements beforehand, but in the meantime, thank you, Joanne and thank you. Andres.